episode of Read Science where we talk with science writers who um, take uh, their a lot of their time and energy uh, and enthusiasm to explain complex topics to the general public. And today, our um, author we have with us is David Epstein, and he oh, just finished a seven-year stint with uh, Sports Illustrated as the science writer there, um, has, uh, is moving, transitioning to a uh, uh, new position where he will be able to write uh, on many different topics other than topics that have a science hook. Um, but today we're going to talk about his book, The Sports Gene, uh, Inside the Science of Extraordinary Athletic Performance. I read the entire thing. It was fantastic. Welcome, David. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're so glad you're here. So why don't we let Jeff start off with the first question. David, it's nice to meet you and, and have you on the show. And like Joanne just said, Science communication is sort of our sometimes distant foundation for the program. And I have a, I want to start with a communication topic because here you have this, this book, The Sports Gene. And what do we have? We have sports and we have science in one place. And it's very rare for these two things to come about. And you're not really talking about the science of sports, but you're talking about the science of performance in sports. What we know about that scientifically, where extraordinary performance comes from, what its might limits, what its limits might be. I'm one of the people in your audience that your publisher was wondering about who is not a sports fan. And I didn't recognize all the names of the famous athletes, the famous events that you used, but I was happy to see that I felt like you were using them to illustrate a point and that I got the point of the illustration without having to have too much sports background, so I was able to enjoy that, and it seemed to me quite possible that there's enough sports stuff there to draw the sports people into not overlooking the science as it goes by, and I'm thinking from the times when I've written things, that doesn't happen by accident, that takes planning, and so the question is, how did you decide on, how did you arrive at this balance of blending this science understanding of vocabulary with the sports understanding of vocabulary? That's a, that's a great question and I can tell you it's one that in sort of different ways was asked by publishers when I was meeting with publishers with my book proposal mm -hmm. um, because there, there were sort of a couple questions that came up over and over as I met with publishers. One was often uh, is this the next Born to Run, which was the, the <laughs> book that sparks sort of the barefoot running craze and I'm not sure what the next Born to Run is so the answer to that was usually no. Um, another was, where will you come down on nature or nurture? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I usually said, well, I'm not sure yet, but I can tell you it's going to be some of, of both and, and different mixes in different cases, and that turned some off. And then another was asking in different ways why I didn't think the book would fall between audiences. You know, did I mm -hmm. think it would be on the science shelf, or did I think it would be on the sports shelf at the bookstore, or did I feel like there was a danger of missing both of those audiences? Um, and I did feel like there was a danger of missing both of those audiences. Well, did, uh, did no one suspect that you might be able to attract both of those audiences? I think, I think Penguin certainly did, or the current imprint at Penguin, which was, <laughs> so the current imprint was, was just being started specifically for science books, which mm -hmm. is why I decided to go with, um, with that imprint as opposed to some of the sports imprints um, that, that I was talking to, because I felt like this was a science book being told through sports, and, and you know, you're right, it did take a lot of planning, and, and my first draft was 40,000 words longer, mm -hmm. and that 40,000 words didn't come out of the sports narrative. It, mm -hmm. it came out of, you know, m more of the science. And, and I, at the last minute, actually changed my entire first chapter. Mm -hmm. So in, in the first chapter, I talk about the perceptual piece that allows major league hitters to intercept yes. speeding objects that are literally too fast for their reflexes. Mm -hmm. And originally, I started with me being tested in a lab for those skills, and sort of showing how uh, why I wasn't able to perform certain skills when I was put in a in a simulation against digital women's handball players, yeah. and I thought that was really cool. From you know, and and if if it were if I were writing it for National Geographic, that's like where I would have started. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I decided um, because I, I felt like I would really risk losing the sports audience entirely if I started in the lab instead of on the field. So that was sort of the last choice I made. 
was to to change that and start instead with this women's softball pitcher who can strike out major mm-hmm. league hitters. So, but those are hard choices because I really liked that um, that that chapter. And I wrote in the citations that the original. The original uh, title of my first chapter was Beat by a Digital Girl, and it was in reference to me. Um, but those are tough choices, and I don't know that there's a perfect balance, but mm-hmm. I seem at least not to have totally alienated my, my audience. Well, so, the, so nobody can accuse you of uh, throwing like a digital girl. <laughs> no, I wish. <laughs> on, on the other hand, since we haven't seen the first draft, I'm sure that was an interesting story. But the first chapter, nevertheless, is fascinating the way it is. And just last night, I was telling someone, you wouldn't believe how fast you have, to, you know, how little time you have to, to be ready to hit this ball that's coming at you. You have to start swinging before it leaves the pitcher's hands because of the milliseconds. And naturally, I was talking like a scientist about it. Right. But uh, it's, it's still a great story and a great way to start these all of these different dimensions to investigate about how both nature and nurture can affect these things that we think come from someplace else so often. And, and, and I also hoped that sort of anecdotes like that one in the first chapter might actually get people thinking about these things when they mm-hmm. watch sports. So if you, if you realize how impossible it is for a hitter just to react to one of those pitches, you might notice things like that. They synchronize... Uh, sort of the wind-up of their swing to the pitcher's wind-up. So they're really starting their swing way before the pitcher has thrown the ball. Yeah. And so I was hoping that, that people would sort of get interested in those things or looking at the flicker, which is the flashing pattern uh, the seams of the ball make when there's a replay in slow motion. And, and so I sort of hoped that people might look at, you know, watch the sports just with that in mind a little differently. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it, that... it definitely made me watch sports a little differently, some of the things I learned. Mm-hmm. It... That's interesting because, of course, I'm not a sports person. You, I'm not exactly dragged kicking and screaming to soccer and baseball <laughs> games that the kids play in. But, you know, I still I don't I don't relate to it naturally like their dad does, who has sort of a whole lifetime of talking about it and watching. And so I'm learning right along with it, and like the science and reading, you know, science related with the sports anecdotes and the hooks. Uh, helps me relate to it even better, and I did really enjoy that baseball chapter because um, you know, my son is sort of known for being a good pitcher for his age in this town. You know, so what does that mean? It doesn't mean he's going to go on to major leagues or anything. Um, but you know, it's just very fascinating to 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 read about those things that you just said, and and even how they've done testing where they paint over the red stripes and how mm-hmm. you know the batters can't respond exactly the same way. So that that has to do partly with training, and partly with some of the genetic, the visual acuity right. has its genetic component. So um, I felt like when you when all was said and done through the entire book. You, you know, there is no doubt that there is a heritable component. There are the possibility of mutations that have come along, heritable, heritable as well. And then that the environment was extraordinarily important. And, but I did remember there was a person who, uh, whose quote was repeated quite often through the book, was, uh, choose your parents well. Yeah. That's, that's your first step. So, <laughs> you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, the, yeah, the, that was, the, na- the nature part of it. Yeah, that was Giannis Pitsilatis, um, a uh-huh. scientist at the University of Glasgow who basically travels around the world collecting DNA uh, from elite athletes. You know, he spends a lot of time in Kenya and a lot of time in Jamaica. He's a really interesting guy. You know, I, I know he once was at a dinner party and bumped into an elite marathoner, and so he tried to sterilize a wine glass uh, uh-huh. to, to collect some of his uh-huh. saliva. And what Giannis, a lot of his findings, he's found sort of extraordinary environments in the places he's gone uh, in Kenya and, and Jamaica. And in some cases, um, people have interpreted his work as meaning that because those environments are important, the genes aren't also important. So he's he's now gotten used to saying so. And, that, and we see that when, when sort of sports, nature, nurture, sports issues are written about in the popular press that the idea that there is an environmental input somehow crowds out the idea that there's, al- that there's also a genetic input, mm-hmm. which is sort of frustrating. So Giannis has taken to saying, you absolutely must choose your parents correctly. Um, obviously rhetorically, because we don't choose our parents that way, but, but he, he'll be the first to tell you, although he's, he emphasizes how important the environment is, 
he'll be the first to tell you that if somebody walks into his lab after puberty with an oxygen carrying capacity that's average, they're never going to run, uh, you know, two ten, two hours and ten minutes in the marathon. That's just it. Just it just doesn't happen. Slow slow people never become fast, and that's also repeated in the book by a number of researchers who study speed. Well, I think in that that whole nature versus nurture thing, which is in a way is what one of your big themes through the whole books that we're going to talk about a lot probably. You talk, uh, you describe that as being the, the hardware and the software. So if the hardware is the, uh, the genetic components, the software is the training. And so early on you're talking about the, the fad and thinking that anybody can be anything as long as they train for 10,000 hours or 100,000, which you refer to as downloading a software, which is very good imagery. And where we are in sort of social paradigms from, you know, that's the context we get these questions from. It's, it's pretty easy to say, well, uh, it seems very likely that it should be hardware plus software, but we've been through sequences of these things in the past decades where we go through a period of, no, everybody can be anything she wants to be, all she has to do is train, or no, it's all genetics because there's a gene for sports, or no, it's all racial because uh, these people have to run faster because they're not smart. And so I, I keep wanting to find out more about how the science as a social, socially embedded sort of thing, and I'm not postmodern about this, I hope, but nevertheless, we're all influenced by these questions, and we've sure been through some weird, what seem now like weird paradigms for the last 50 years that have really colored these theories about how somebody could be the world's fastest runner or, or why they shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's, it's been sort of strange when I look back in the scientific literature to see how the pendulum swings. Um, that sort of gave me a little bit of a new view on sort of how science works sometimes because uh, I would talk to scientists who in decades past were studying perceptual expertise back when you know, coaches of uh, Olympic teams would be testing people for simple reaction time, you know, how quick they can hit a button in response to a light and right. using that as a selection process despite the fact that it now is known to be useless because their averages are the same. Uh, I mean, I scored faster on a visual reaction time test than Albert Pujols, who's one of the best baseball hitters in history. Right. Um, and it, it, some of the scientists who studied practice would t even tell me that, yeah, you know, I knew I was being extreme, but I had to get people to listen, and now I'm able to be more centrist, which is what I always was, which is interesting to hear from a scientist to basically say, yeah, I, I knew I was jumping beyond my data, making conclusions beyond my data, but I, I had to get people to listen that practice is, is also important. And now that, you know, there are about five best-selling books that came out saying that practice is the only thing, or, or mm -hmm. either the only thing or almost the only thing, depending on which one of the books you pick, now some of those same scientists have started inching back and saying, well, of, of course genetics are important, and they tend to start with height. They say, well, you know, you can't be in the NBA for the most part if you're not taller. But that's no more a fixed characteristic than the length of your Achilles tendon or the surface area of your lungs. It's just, it's just a lot easier to detect. And I think, of course, w one of the reasons why I actually liked the second chapter where I write about the tale of two high jumpers, mm -hmm. one is to show the variability in this 10,000 hours idea because that came from a tiny study of violinists who were so highly pre-screened they were already right. you know, in a world-famous music academy. And so it's like taking NBA centers and saying, noticing they all practiced a lot and, you know, forgetting that they're seven feet tall. Um, but also that average obscured the individual differences. So you can always take an average and, and make it some magic number, just like with the average number of hours to expertise in chess study is 11,053, but some people make it in 3,000 hours and some make it in 25, mm -hmm. or don't make mm -hmm. it, make it to 25,000, still haven't made it. So you really want to know the range. And with those two high jumpers I write about, one who has about 20,000 hours of practice and one who's got about eight months, and they meet at the World Championships and the, and the new guy wins, I think even, in, even in, among two athletes in one pretty straightforward sport, you have one guy who's sort of an extreme nurture path and one guy who's an extreme nature path, and it really shows that this idea of a nature or nurture solution, you can't even apply it to two guys mm -hmm. who are basically doing the same thing in the same sport. Mm -hmm. You right, have, it turned out the new guy, he, just, he it was something with his Achilles tendon. So it mm -hmm. comes down to physics, to biophysics, essentially. Sure. 
that gave him the advantage. Yeah, and yeah. interestingly, he, he contradicts that 10,000 hours rule in every direction. He's hard to figure out because he, he entered high jumping on a lunchtime bet, became the world champion, and now he's been a pro for six years and hasn't improved at all. So I'm not quite sure what to make out of him. Well, and then you had someone that you quoted early on that, that shed light on this who just said that, that the slow never become fast. That's right. That's that, that's a uh, yeah. That was Justin Durant. Improve, but they don't they don't change their ranking that much. Nobody becomes extraordinarily faster uh, right. if they're not fast to start with. That's right. That was Justin Durant of the the high performance director at the Sports Science Institute of South mm -hmm. Africa, who basically goes around the country testing kids for speed in the hopes of recruiting new rugby players. Uh, and and yeah. So if you're if you're going to be fast at that really elite level, clearly you can improve speed and the ability to sustain speed. But all indications are that you also need to be born with a, with a high proportion of, of type two or fast twitch muscle fibers. Right. Well, in this in this uh, outlook of whether it's nature or nurture, I guess we're prone to black and white. But are we cursed forever to have the pendulum swinging back and forth, or do you think there's a synthesis possible that finally understands that you need both? I, I do. I'm I'm maybe I have to be. Uh, have a positive outlook about this because I, you know, my life's work, I hope, is kind of bringing science to the public. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the media, you know, I don't like to blame everything on the media because the media is, is, is even more very, you know, we have a low barrier to entry to be in the media. We have a very, you know, very broad sort of spectrum of the media. But the kind of reporting most of the time, at least up till very recently, when genes appear in mainstream media, it's to say, well, we found the alcoholic gene, or the promiscuous gene, or the chocolate lover gene, as if they're these single genes mm -hmm. that completely negate any sense of free will, and that's really a disservice to, um, you know, the actual science. And and I do think, as people are, you know, I just saw in the New York Times an article about uh, mosaicism, and and you know. I wrote a little bit about epigenetics. I decided to cut the mm -hmm. chapter because the science is so nascent, but then I let a tech blog publish it with sort of a disclaimer. Mm -hmm. And I do think um, ultimately we'll be able to move toward a more reasoned take, and especially as people begin to interact with genetically personalized medicine and realize we're talking in most cases about risk factors and statistical mm -hmm. risk factors and not about, um, you know, some genes are deterministic, like they, the ones that give you two eyeballs or all the same brain chemicals that all of us have. Um, or Huntington's disease, for example, but many of them are just predisposition, and I think, I hope, um, that as people begin to interact with that in a practical way, they'll get a better sense of that, and the media will as well. I hope. What do you think? <laughs> I, I hope that happens, and that's that's the reason we, Joanne and I are motivated by that, to try to get a, uh, a less superficial, more integrated understanding of how science fits into everybody's picture and uh, that that can expand the uh, sophistication of that thinking maybe. I, I can tell you that one area that sort of this reminds me of is in one section of the book where I write about the APOE gene we've known that one version predisposes increases risk of Alzheimer's uh, since the 90s and more recently um, results are finding that it's, it's sort of involved in all manner of recovery from brain injury and so people who have the E4 version uh, one copy at least will be more predisposed to having permanent brain damage if they, you know, mm -hmm. they have more brain bleeding, more post-injury seizures if they get in car accidents, they're more likely to die, and the same looks to be true for football players and boxers. And but when I talked to doctors, they said they, for the most part, don't make patients aware that this test is there for two main reasons: mm -hmm. one, that it's only risk information, and they don't, they're not sure they can convey it appropriately because it's right. it's hard to. You know, it's, it's early in the science, and they have some sense of the increased risk, but not exactly, so they would rather not sort of tell people about it. And the other was that they can't do anything about their DNA. Right. Now, that second reason I sort of um, am frustrated by because they can do something about their environment if they uh -huh. happen to be playing football, for uh -huh. example. But, but, th but those were the questions that came up. I, doctors are clearly struggling with this idea of whether it's time to sort of uh, talk to the public about some of the genetic testing that's well, available. And I'll ask Joanne's opinion, but do, don't we both trace this sort of in the end, isn't this what we're working about, that we believe it's a, uh, a deficiency in general scientific literacy? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I tend to say, and I don't know what you think about this, that one of like the major sort of problems that, that I think and that I hope my work 
you know, helps with in society is sort of the difficulty that, that people have understanding what constitutes evidence and how to use evidence to make mm -hmm. decisions very broadly. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned the APOE gene, and of course you, you mentioned that you had written um, an article about, uh, done some research on direct-to-consumer genetic testing and the flaws in that, and so that sort of relates here. Um, and of course, um, many of our viewers might know that uh, when James Watson, one of the discoverers of DNA, he had his genome sequence, one of the first humans to have his genome sequence, he didn't want to know if he had that gene because it indicates um, a propensity towards Alzheimer potentially mm -hmm. disease. So he didn't want to know if he had that. Um, so I was tested for it too. So were you? So, I did a so bunch of testing. Yeah. T tell us a little bit about the direct to consumer testing and 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 even let's sort of move the conversation into: Are we ever going to just? scan someone's genome and say, well, we've got a future sprinter on our hands or we've got a great shot putter uh, coming up and you might want to consider this, you know, mom and dad, um, when you, you know, as you raise your child. Well, I can tell you that that, <laughs> for sprinters, that is being done, but not appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, the, so the direct-to-consumer marketing, as is often the case, is moving much faster than regulation. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so for quite a while now, so there are a number of companies that offer testing uh, for, you know, sports screening genetic testing. And the most common gene that's offered, now they're beginning to be bigger panels, but they always include a gene called ACTN3 mm -hmm. that codes for a protein that's only found in fast twitch muscle fibers. And they'll, they'll say, so it, it, this, this gene, if you don't have at least one version of the so-called right uh, variant for sprinting, then you're not going to be in the final of the 100 meters in Rio in 2016. Like, fine. It explains a small bit of variance at the very top level, but it, that only rules out about 1 billion people of 7 billion people on Earth. Mm -hmm. and, and as Carl Foster, a former president of the American College of Sports Medicine, as I quoted him in the book, he said, the best genetic tool right now is a stopwatch. Take your kid to the park and have him race the other kids. You know, it's like why, why measure something so indirectly when you don't know the other genes that contribute when you could measure it directly? Mm -hmm. But it's just the avant-garde sort of allure of genetic testing. And, and really, you know, parents are being sold something that's of very little information value. And, and the, the marketing material will usually even say, it's different from company to company, but it will usually say if your kid has the sprint version, put them into sprint sports. And if they have the, they don't have the sprint version, then they're good for endurance sports. And there's there's no evidence of that second side. Uh -huh. That not having the sprint version means they're better for endurance sports. That's just sort uh -huh. of uh, made up. So some of the injury and illness gene testing, I think there can be a use for if people can understand it appropriately. But the the talent selection, I mean, one would be way better off with direct measurements of things like body proportions or or certain skills. I mean, the the reason that when countries host the Olympics, like we saw this with Australia and then China and then London, is because seven years out when they're awarded the Olympics, they start a talent search and they start it focused on the smaller sports. They don't start it for track and field where the whole world is already competing. They start it for uh, rowing and things like that. So in the sports that won't get a big pipeline of talent on their own. So the woman who actually, Helen Glover is the woman who won the first gold medal for the home team at these, uh, the London Olympics. She was identified four years before the Olympics in a program called Sporting Giants, where sports officials went and measured people in schools and clubs and said, you know, boy, you have a low brachial index, which is like your forearm, proportion of your mm -hmm. forearm to your total arm, and are tall. How about rowing? And four years later, she's a national icon because she's uh, the first gold medalist of the London Games. That, much more useful for those kind of direct measurements than, right. than so that, the, the phenotype, that the yes. outward expression of the genetic. And of course, we see this. Uh, Sports Illustrated has that beautiful uh, edition, the body edition, and you just see. Well, of course, you see how different sports tend to have different physiques. You know, that, that's just, you know, an amazing thing to take a look at, and of course, how, you know, um, fit everybody is, because they spend all that time training, no matter what their sport is. Let, let me so, see if I can show you this really quickly. I don't know if it'll show up, but you just reminded me, in the Sports Illustrated office, there's a great photo 
of athletes from different sports lined up, you know, sort of scantily clad so you can see their mm -hmm. body types. Mm -hmm. I think I have one on my phone, although I don't know if it'll be visible, but let me see if I can hold that up here real quick. Because um, it's a really, really great picture. Sorry, I'll know in 10 seconds if I have it or not. <laughs> it's okay. We yeah, well, I, I am familiar with the, the, the body edition where those photos come mm -hmm. from, and I just oh. you, know, you marvel at it. It's I don't know if this will be too small to see, but this is a... Oh, wow. Is that too small to see? Uh, I get it. No. We get a good impression. Is there, is there, by any chance, an online version of that? If we have a link, yes. we can, we yeah, can post it. There probably is. The photographer is um, Howard Schatz, and I think he has a lot of the shots on his website. And th those are the Olympic yeah, performers. Yeah, zoomed right? in a little bit. Yeah, these are our elite performers, and there's like sumo wrestlers and all kinds of. So Howard Schatz, yeah, I think he has a lot of them on his his website. Right. Yeah, I've I've seen that as well as the the other uh, sports figures. It's just, um, it, I mean, and it drives the point home um, that you know, er, you know, different sports require different things. Uh, one thing I found interesting in the book, and this is just me uh, being unaware, uh, but that uh, soccer, Amer uh, you know, uh, what everybody else calls football, but in America we call it soccer. There was that comment that they're all trained the same. Like every position's trained the same, whereas you know, like you look at American football, and your wide receiver is going to be trained differently than your quarterback, than right. whatever, and that there was an issue with that. Right, right, and so the the man who I who I sort of talked to about that in the book is Jesper Anderson, who's a great scientist who works in Denmark with elite athletes and was an elite athlete himself. And what he'll do is he'll take muscle biopsies of of any athlete who's willing that he works with and tailor their training accordingly. So he's, he's taken a shot putter who he found had far more fast switch muscle fibers in his upper body than the guys he was competing against and said, you're training too much. You know, you're, giving, you're, you're changing some of your muscle fibers to have more endurance uh, qualities. So stop. Train really hard, then just go sleep. And, and he, he took him from being really good to being a medalist um, and then a celebrity in Denmark. He won the Danish version of Dancing with the Stars after he won an Olympic medal. Um, and, and he's done the opposite for guys who have more slow twitch fibers, like a kayaker who wanted to make the national team in the 500. He said, your start's too slow. You're never going to catch up, move to longer distances. And that guy became a world-class performer right away. But in soccer, he says, that he has trouble getting the coaches to listen to him, where he'll say, look, we're training all these guys the same, and the guys who can contract their muscles really powerfully, who have these, all these fast twitch muscle fibers, are getting injured because they can't sustain the same quantity of training as the guy with slow twitch muscle fibers. So when he looks at fiber type proportions, they become more skewed towards slow twitch as he goes up in level in soccer, which presumably is not necessarily what the coaches want. They want some of those those fastest guys, at least for certain positions. But the and fastest they're, they're, guys have been weeded out because right. they, they've been injured. They're weeding them out training. by not individualizing mm -hmm. training for their biology. So I think, that, that's why, again, I mentioned this a couple times in the book, that I think the American College of Sports Medicine's new motto, exercise is medicine, is so appropriate because not, not only that it's healthy, but it's just as we've seen in medical genetics, there's a personalized response to sort of any treatment that you take. And I think that's exercise genetics is showing that that's increasingly true uh, in sports training so, as well. Um, I was down at NASA uh, at Johnson Space Center not too long ago, and there was a comment. You know, we're you know we know so much about genetics and genomics, and you could potentially some of the traits you can see through a genomic testing or other testing, and could potentially choose people who are better at living in space for a while. Just like you know, we could potentially choose someone who's a better athlete based on certain genes, but the people at NASA go. No, we can't do that. I mean, and even, um, and you, you even mentioned about some scientists who can't discuss race. You know, like there's just a taboo about mm -hmm. sort of this uh, determinis determinism, you know, whether, you know, there's a, a presumption about race that they would be faster runners or, or right. just if a genetic thing came up. So why don't you elaborate a bit on that, this hesitancy to be seen as someone who says, it's determined. Right. Or, or the other way, yeah. Right, so specifically with regard to race, actually, I, it almost sort of scared me out of writing the book. I actually put mm -hmm. the project aside briefly and almost decided not to do it because, um, you know, I, I, I would just, I, it was actually after talking to a number, I, I'll tell you the exact anecdote that sort of 
scared me to the mm -hmm. point where I thought about stopping was I was actually at an American College of Sports Medicine conference and was having lunch with um, a head of a kinesiology department from a major research university and he told me that he was he had data on ethnic differences mm -hmm. that he wasn't publishing mm -hmm. and, and this was from a study of the response of exercisers to a dietary supplement right. um, and he had found differences between his black and white subjects and he didn't want to publish it because he was afraid that this would lead to the suggestion that he was supporting innate intellectual differences right as if these two had anything to do with one another and in the book I, I write about the fact that this this idea that um, athletic and intellectual prowess are on some kind of biological teeter-totter only really arose when athletic prowess became associated with African Americans around mm -hmm. the time of Jesse Owens uh, anyway but the stigma is obviously so powerful that it's really become a third rail I think um, for for a lot of people to touch and 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 it, I think it goes to some of the same uh, sort of themes as genetic determinism. It's just this idea that that we are totally out of control. You know that by virtue of something in our biology, we have no uh, free will. And unfortunately, I don't think that's what most of genetics actually actually says. It's just so you know there's such a sci-fi quality to genetics that will uh -huh. engineer everything and and do these kinds of selection and. Uh, you know, and, and it's weird to me because obviously we, we look at something like the NFL Combine, right, where a bunch of guys are in like, it's like a, it's like a, you know, they're like a bunch of cattle. They stick a number on them and they mm -hmm. basically and put them in their underwear and they prod them and measure them every which way. And that's that's not objectionable at all, but, um, you know, taking a cheek swab, I, it's, but you know. But genetics, genetics still seems uh, magical to most people, doesn't yeah. it? And they're still stuck in the idea that there's a gene for everything and that that gene expresses a determinism and all that right. but I just finished the chapters on excellence you know in short distance running and Jamaica and how that long story traces back to the west coast of Africa and sickle cell anemia and then long distance running and uh, slow twitch muscle fibers and how all this traces back to certain regions and genetic diversity of eastern Africa and you can't avoid talking about race if race is one of the mental divisions you want to use there even though it's you know these genetic cohorts and the history and how can you get I think you did a good job in a general Thanks. way how can you get past that sort of oh, it's racial we gotta stop right now we can't right. talk about racial just saying no it's a longer story you can talk about it in terms of race, but it's not. We're talking about these long, long histories of things that have developed. And you can't deny that these people in Jamaica have something going on that tells us and reveals a whole lot. And if you want to say, well, that's black people in Jamaica and it's all racial, that's a stupid thing to say. But it's a long story and you can't always tell these short stories quickly. Right. No, that's, that's definitely true. And I mean, you can actually see to that point of not being able to tell them quickly, there's a there's a section. I mean, before I even start writing about these sort of talent hotbeds in Jamaica and in, and in the Western Rift Valley in Kenya, I sort of the longest section in the book where I basically leave sports is where I talk about kind of grapple with what race even means and doesn't mm -hmm. mean uh, in a genetic context, and and I'm not sure how you can do that in a shorter space. I mean, I really just took a couple thousand words and said I'm not even going to talk about sports for a minute here. I'm just going to talk right. about genetic diversity. And that's a not something I could have done in the pages of a of a major publication, which makes it difficult. Um, because I think that I hope, and I think it did, because I haven't been sort of branded as as racist um, <laughs> to my delight. That uh -huh. uh, that that made people feel sort of that I was approaching it uh, from an academic standpoint. That I was allowing some of the experts in the field to speak for themselves, and that the idea that is just black athletes, right? In in many ways, the the athletes from that small area of West Africa, no matter what their current homeland is, who dominate sprints. And the, the athletes from the Kalenjin tribe, who are the most overrepresented in the distance running in Kenya, could not be more physiologically distinct. Mm -hmm. they, they do share certain, because of low latitude, they have genes that code for dark skin that protects from equatorial sunlight. They tend to have higher uh, length legs compared to their body proportions. But otherwise, in many ways, they could not be more different physiologically. So. I think making sure to highlight physiological difference, even while talking about certain shared similarities, I guess, I guess worked 
worked okay, no. but it's tough because I don't know how you do that in a short space. I don't know. From a communication viewpoint for us, it's the same, and there are several places. I mean, you see it here with the, the sports, the determinism, the race. We see it with many science topics where people can understand, and I say, you can understand anything that I'm doing, but it may take a while to talk about it. It's like, where and how do we, how do we find the outlet for those stories that have to take a little bit longer because you just can't do them, do what they need to be done in two sentences. And, 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 and actually, I'll add, add on to that, like, um, as I mentioned to you before in a brief conversation that, you know, I put up, you know, hey, I'm reading this great book, mm -hmm. I like to do that for authors, put up photos, say I'm reading it, I'm enjoying it, and, you know, immediately a couple people jump on and just say, eugenics. I mean, they, they just <laughs> judgment that has no science and and I I don't know if this has been you know an issue forever and ever or if our life is so sound bite that we assume we know everything about it just by a small thing right yeah so yeah so I yeah I would like you to to talk about you know where where can we appropriately share this kind of the more complex information uh, without losing an audience well, and, and also, and, and to that point, first, the, you know, I think for people who are saying eugenics, I assume probably mostly people that aren't sort of deeply entrenched in science, I think. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but sometimes I think the way when I talk about these things in conversation is to try to talk about why it might be important to think in a different way first. So in, in the book, I highlight some, um, a, a few instances in medical history where denying ethnic differences in genetics cause mm -hmm. very bad outcomes yeah. medically. So so I understand that people come from a good place wanting to say, hey, you know, we're all we're all exactly the same. But I think it's pretty clear uh, from the history of science in this area that the best way to get the best outcomes for all people is to understand what differences are real and important and then find out how you can get the best outcomes for all people. And sometimes I, I, I think approaching it and saying, look, this is why I think it's important to think about it this way, get someone who's coming from a good place but hadn't, hadn't thought about it that way, um, you know, in, in sort of a more friendly state of mind where they can, they can start yeah. to think about why they might want to think differently and maybe why their, their gut instinct about what's the useful social message maybe isn't necessarily. You know, and that's, I think in some fields why scientists study certain things because our gut instinct about what's the most useful or the best is not necessarily correct. Can, um, I, can I make a parallel then with what I think of as sort of my scientist and it may be personal perspective that it's usually worth it to spend more time refining and making more precise the question and because when we understand the question better we're going to get better answers and you're saying if we understand the questions and the uh, the outcomes or the consequences involved, maybe that will make people sit still for the answer? I, I think so. I think so, or at least, because I think when people have that instinctive, because what you're describing is like a reflexive eugenics yep. mm -hmm. um, yep. response. Yep. And if someone's in reflexive mode, I don't think that's the mode where they're ready to learn something new. Mm -hmm. right. and, and so I think you have to somehow um, make it clear that you're coming from a good place but ready to challenge their thinking in a way that isn't just... Um, like a cable news, you know, like polarization of either you're on this side or you're on uh -huh. you're on that side kind of thing. Uh -huh. And and so as broad as that is, I, I and I do tend to believe that again, whatever field we're looking in is is finding the differences that are real important eventually will allow us to pursue the outcomes that are best um, for all people and, and for our society. And and so I hope that and I've found that some people who are who are well intentioned but haven't looked into the science themselves will will find that thought-provoking and, and, and it'll make them open to new mm. discussion. That has a great resonance, I think, with me and Joanne because we talk at, to, with each other at times about how we think that uh, an anti-science, anti-science literacy attitude comes from some sort of estrangement that the science is seen as outside, as other, as non-cultural, that it's not integrated into everyday life and so we're talking about your blending in this book of sports with science and trying to make those go together. And that's, that strikes me as the same sort of integration and then finding this way to tell people that there's an important question 
and that we're going to challenge your thinking, but we're all after the same thing, is also attacking that question of how to integrate science into these various topics. And you've done, you've, you know, you've shown us one way that works very nicely with, you know, sports. Not your typical people who are receptive to science, we think, but that's a, that's a knee-jerk reaction. And you've shown them that there are many interesting questions that have consequences that draw on all of these things. So, I'm inspired. Thank you. <laughs> hey, you know, and and I also think something you mentioned there just made me think. I think scientists and and journalists both actually. Um, Often, sort of suffer from the Hollywood portrayal of what they do, mm -hmm. um, and and so I tried to work into the book. Sometimes, some you know, at, world famous athletes are characters in the book, but sometimes the scientists are characters too. And I wanted mm -hmm. to show them sometimes struggling with things they had learned or attempting to do their science, because everyone, even if they don't care about science at all, occasionally comes across a scientific result. But I don't mm -hmm. think most people come across a scientific process at all and sort of, right. you know, yeah. and I'll see in, in journalism, I think sometimes it's almost become fashionable to criticize science for producing just so stories mm -hmm. uh, all the time. Whereas if you follow science, you can differentiate between science that's, that's done better, that, that is making predictions that are testable yes. and making a model that you can then yes. subject to. Uh, being falsified versus somebody who's just sort of making up, you know, speculating um, based on what they think from their data. And I, and I allowed people to speculate in my book sometimes, scientists to yes. speculate, yes, but I tried to make it clear when they were speculating. But yeah, I, I, like, I like the, the amusing story. I, it's not amusing. I would not be amused if I were the scientist. He counted on this one person to get 200 unique oh, yeah. DNA cheek swabs for testing. <laughs> And instead, he had 200 perfectly identical. So the guy had taken, yeah. the guy he had entrusted to do this, taken 200 different samples from yeah, himself. And, and the guy, the guy told him, he said, you know, when he got back to the lab, he said, well, because this was this sort of cloistered group of people who descended from from Jamaican slaves who escaped British rule and won their freedom, you know, a century before official emancipation. And so the guy told Giannis, the the scientist, that. Well, we're just all really closely related, you know. We've been intermarrying. Yana said, "They're identical, <laughs> not, not, not closely related." Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, just to show the amount of variation in people. Um, uh, let me ask about writing for uh, Sports Illustrated. Uh, it, did you, have you ever written something that just sort of fell flat, like you know, nobody could receive the the science within it, or, or it was I don't I don't I can't even imagine scenarios, but a good writer shouldn't have that happen, but maybe it does. I mean, I've definitely had sort of more sports articles, but specific to sports science articles, it would... Yes. I wouldn't say anything that felt totally flat, but we did have... Um, I did do a couple years ago sort of a special issue on sports science and medicine, and that included... I, in retrospect, felt that maybe we should have spread those articles out instead of mm -hmm. putting them in a package, because I think we might have science overloaded some of... Uh, the audience, because this is a very wide uh, general audience for Sports Illustrated, and that those articles included some of the topics in the book, anticipatory skills, uh, pain tolerance. Um, we had another article on sort of new new age prostheses for uh, Paralympians, and we got some letters to the magazine saying, like, I'm not subscribing to the New England Journal of Medicine. Kind of thing. Right, um, right. So Scientific American could write could have an issue like this, but maybe it was too right. much for Sports Illustrated. But we got some, we got some, you know, articles of praise as uh, letters of praise as well. So it was, a, it was a, a little hard to tell. But in retrospect, I think maybe we would have been better off spreading those out. Um, whereas we can very easily do like an NFL package, and nobody would blink an eye. I think maybe a full-on <laughs> science package where it was like, you know, twenty whatever straight pages. You know, it was like almost a half of of the entire magazine might have been. Um, a little bit much for some of the readers. So, so the next challenge is the swimsuit slash science edition, <laughs> <laughs> which no one will remember the science that was in the edition at all. <laughs> that that would definitely yeah be reaching a new audience. So. <laughs> well, when I was in college, the uh, what was it called? You know, the engineering of the strapless evening gown was a very popular title. So <laughs> there, there's potential there. And <laughs> speaking of gender, I do have one. One question, just to zoom over. Uh, I was fascinated to read in the chapter where you were talking about 
determining gender for the purposes of competition, generally at the Olympics, and the occasional scandal that comes up about whether a person is, quote, really a man or really a woman and things. And um, I think I've asked several other of our guests this, but isn't it, is it odd, uh, or you know, this is an essay question, is it odd that we have so many more tools to look so much more closely inside the human body, examine the chromosomes, look at the DNA sequence, whatever we feel like, do MRIs and things, and by golly, it's only become harder to figure out who's a woman and who's a man, as though the, if that matters. Is it, What's the is story it, here? Is it, is it odd? I think, I think intuitively it is odd, but I think um, scientifically not odd at all. I think there's uh -huh. tons of examples of, of uh, <laughs> things that we thought were simplistic. Genetics as a whole, which if uh -huh. you go back and look at articles you know, when the genome was sequenced, there are doctors saying, we're going to be carrying around like a credit card size uh, chip yeah. with our genome, and in five years, you're just going to present that at the doctor's office. Yeah. And there's going to be a gene for this and a gene for that. And ten years later, you know, it's 4,000 gene variants that account for only part of the variance in height, you know, an easily measurable trait, and, and things look different. I, I think it's often the case that the more we learn about something, the more complex it is. And, and the scientific answer to this issue of dividing men and women is that I'm sorry, human biology doesn't always break down into the binary as neatly as sports governing officials wish it would. So there is an answer. It's just one that makes it messier for sports governing officials. My uh, favorite for scientists. example that may or may not be quite correct, but when I was, say, uh, in high school, it seemed like one of the big biology questions was uh, cell differentiation in early development. How do cells know to become liver cells? How do they know to become brain cells, heart cells? And then someplace while I wasn't looking in the last 40 years, evolutionary developmental biology comes along, the focus shifts and we can investigate a lot more closely and start to understand how important the developmental process is in turning a lump of cells into a differentiated body. And the, the outcome of being able to look better there suggests to me that in cases like trying to determine gender, that maybe what needs to change is the question. And that not, not that the answer is getting clearer to the original question, but now we can understand the question better. And the original question was not a good question. That, that, I, I agree with that completely. And I can't, I'm, I'm trying to go through in my head, but I can't think of a single area of knowledge where I've ever learned more and it's become simpler or where I didn't mm -hmm. realize that the questions that I originally had were, mm -hmm. were not the most useful ones. I can't think of, you know, whether that's just watching sports or, or learning about science or anything. So mm -hmm. I think we should, we should, I think you're absolutely right. I think it, it, it's a profound thing, I think, and it would be good if people could sort of start to, to learn to reconsider their questions. Uh, See, and that, that's inter that, that again gets to this idea. I think there are all these things outside of just results that science mm -hmm. has to teach people that are both difficult to convey in the media and totally absent from it, almost. You know, the, the, like there's, there's got to be something in my book that some result in the next couple of years is, is going to change in mm -hmm. a big way. Like if, oh, yeah. if, if you, you'd never write about science if that held you back. Right. Um, and so that's why I think I wish to, I'd love to see more writing sort of about how scientific process works and, and what makes scientists different is the way that they think. And that yeah. can be something that's rarely, um, I think, brought through. And I hope I right. brought some, some of that through um, mm -hmm. in, in my book. I, you know, I, they do say, you know, it's always difficult to get a scientist to give a sound <laughs> bite, right? Yeah. Because we are always like, well, but, you know, and we could go on and there's these contingencies and the this, that, and the other. And I think, you know, a lot of people, well, the media has set it up in such a way that, you know, we want quick, simple, straightforward, 20 seconds. Um, where was I going with this one? That, um, you know, when people think of genetics, for instance, what they learn in school, you have brown eyes because your parents had brown eyes, or maybe, if not, your grandparents had brown eyes. You know what I mean? So you have these things that can't change. And I think that's, you know, just sort of a, almost like they're stuck in a childlike, you know, the first thing they learned way of thinking about genetics. And I think that's where this genetic determinism comes in, where you have fast twitch fibers, so you better be a sprinter and if you don't, then, you know, oh, we assume you should do something not yeah. requiring fast twitch. So um, I do want to, uh, let's see, there is a question here from someone who says, 
what is your best book to read other than yours? And I'm going to take a guess that maybe that means about sports. Like, so if, if you okay. can make some recommendations for books on sports, uh, sports science or whatever, um, yeah, feel free. Or, yeah, and then, then the follow-up question to that is, what are some books you happen to like to read that inspire you as a science writer? Gotcha. So I, I'm, I'm going to pick my first one is going to be um, a both on that question. I might have it right here, so I can let me see if I have it on my shelf. Anyway, called uh, I usually have like five copies because I give them away sometimes. Oh. Just scanning my shelf for it, but a book called Why We Run. Why it's about run? the evolution of human endurance by Bernd Heinrich, who's a biology professor at University of Vermont and was a North American ultra marathon champion. Um, so pretty talented guy and a great writer um, and I like I said I usually I usually like buy a number of copies on Amazon maybe I've given away <laughs> uh, my last well, one. Well that's great to know now I'll add it to my list. <laughs> yeah so he's he's a great he's a great uh, uh, really great writer and I actually just started a book I'm really enjoying called The, the Compatibility Gene. Maybe I should, I'm only gonna read books now that are called The Something Gene. <laughs> um, but it, it's and, and it, it goes to one of the last points you mentioned, which is, um, you know, I think scientists often have to simplify what they're writing even to get it in a peer-reviewed journal, mm -hmm. much less um, in the mainstream press. And this book, the it's a scientist who's writing it, and he's an excellent writer, and he has a note in the front sort of saying, like, I'm streamlining some, streamlining some of these things in certain ways. And he, he, he classifies it in the front, uh, co the table of contents, it's like one page, and it's, it's titled, like, a note to professional scientists who are reading this. <laughs> to me, it's a, it's a note for everybody, right? It, but but it's a really interesting read. But outside of uh, Born to Run is another great. Um, a, Born to Run. It, it's mostly it's about it's the book that sort of sparked the the barefoot running craze. Mm -hmm. right. um, if right. if people are interested more in sort of a, a great reference for uh, you know just tons and tons of studies that's really useful to use as like an index and a reference for exercise science. A book called Cardio or Weights by um, Alex Hutchinson, who has a PhD in physics and was a great runner in Canada. Um, he's a he's he's a really good writer. Is at Sweat Science is his uh, yes. is his Twitter handle. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know who he is on Twitter. Okay. Yeah. So that that's another guy I really like outside of outside of sports. Um, anyway, my my personally favorite writer is an Irish playwright named Martin McDonough. Um, but that's. <laughs> People probably don't care who I'm, what I'm interested in. Outside of, of course, we care. Oh, okay. Yes, we do care. We we do read fiction, and we like we like the idea of a balanced life that integrates the arts with the science, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we do think that's important, and so please uh, don't don't cut that out. But yeah, why we run it? It's the if you're looking for other sports science, that's a that's a really great book, I think. That that's great. This is a fantastic list, and we'll put it beneath the um, we'll put it in the description beneath the video, so that we we can refer to that. And you know, it's it's always great to find out what people are writing. So we've got a few minutes left. I do just want to ask you to uh, maybe explain what your next step is. So you're the author of the Sports Gene. You've just finished your uh, tenure at Sports Illustrated. Yep. So what's next? So I'm, I'm moving on to an a outfit called Pro Publica that I think in Latin means something like in the public interest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I actually interned there previously, and it's, uh, it was started as an effort to replace investigative journalism that's disappearing as the media is being cut back. And mm -hmm. uh, it was started by the former head of the Wall Street Journal and the investigative editor of the New York Times. And they produce stories and that are they think will have a public impact, and they then try to partner with the media outlet where they think it will have the biggest impact. Um, and I'll be there. I'll still do some of my sports science and investigative writing, but I'll also write on issues uh, related to energy and the environment. Um, I have a master's degree in environmental science, so that's sort of my background. And so feel free to bring tips my way. Um, <laughs> are, you going to have, are you going to have some opportunity there, you think, for some of the longer explanations and stories that need to be told? I do. In fact, the when I interned there before, the only thing that they were interested in having me really look at was longer stuff. Mm. They they tend to part of the idea also was to have a place where you know long form investigative reporters could be less distracted. I think. Um, so that's an excellent idea. Yeah. That's yeah, a, well, it's a neat place. 
and, and I have to say, you, you are a talented investigative writer because you said your background was astronomy and geology, yeah. and then you've got the master's in environmental science, and yet here you are jumping into genomics and genetics, as well as taking the sports hook. And so that's, that's impressive. And I, it, writers impress me, you know. Well, I, uh, honestly, you know, from some of the, like, the stuff I studied in geology, there, you know, for this genetics book, I feel like I, I learned some aspects of genetics way better than I, I learned the science uh -huh. I had to learn for my master's, because here I just had entree to just go straight to the world's experts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it was pretty, pretty amazing, actually. Great excuse to bug people I wanted to bug anyway. I think if we, uh, I think if Joanne and I start giving uh, awards for integrating science into everyday life, uh, your book will be a contender. I think yep, you've done an excellent be. job of bringing Thank those you. two things together in a very natural and informing way. I appreciate that's, that. That's not okay. easy to do. And yeah, I, and you made the, the the greatest case. I felt like you did such a fantastic job where it says. It's nature and nurture. Now, mm -hmm. before we went on air, you showed us a photo from someone in your last oh, chapter yeah. of the book. Yeah, let me get that up. And, and by so the way, it's like a good I example of a, a mutation that has done well for this man. Yeah. And, and <laughs> let me say also, I appreciate what you guys are doing. And through through this, I've become acquainted with a number of scientists who are more interested than most in communicating science to the public. And so my dream someday is to start like a communicating science to the public institute with journalists and scientists. So I'm going to put you guys on my list. That's fantastic. This is, Thank you. This is Aero Monturanta, who was uh, probably the greatest endurance athlete in the world um, in the 1960s, a cross-country skier. And in the book, I write about a mutation he has. He's now a reindeer farmer in Arctic Finland. So here he is out in his backyard. And he has a gene mutation that causes him to overproduce red blood cells. And as you can see, his skin has gotten extremely red in his mm. older age. And he's, he's now on some blood thinners. But uh, he's an interesting character from the last chapter of the book. And if, the, the rare example of one gene variant causing a huge difference to right. impact somebody's athleticism. Definitely the if, exception. If people now, want to he, know what that over... Saying, he kept saying, though, in the book, it, it's not that. It's my determination. You know, right. that's... Right. So well, of course you, it you is. Know, the scientists were saying, this, yeah. this is the big thing, but he himself was saying, nope, that's, yeah, if, that's not it. If you want to know the connection between excessive blood cells and endurance running, uh, it's clearly explained. In the, I've just read through some of that, and there's more to come. And uh, I know a lot more about why that would be a connection now, and that's, I feel, uh, yeah. I feel enhanced. Which is why there was that temptation with uh, Lance Armstrong, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what that all was about. But we won't go into that because we're near the end here. Uh, two minutes. David, anything else you would like to tell our audience? Hmm. Um, I'd say, to me, the, the most surprising uh, part of the book was in Chapter 14 where I... Uh, I, I learned that scientists who study genes involved in the dopamine system in the brain's uh, pleasure and reward system have, can actually engineer animal models to make a high drive to be physically active, mm -hmm. uh, 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 which was, I thought, pretty cool and kind of counterintuitive. Um, and the, it, it led to one of my favorite interviews with Pam Reed, a legendary ultramarathoner who reads the science of, of rodent studies to try to figure out herself. And she was, the, when I interviewed her, it was the day after the, National Ultramarathon Championships in New York. She qualified for the World Championships. She was at a flight at LaGuardia Airport. It was delayed, and she gets so antsy when she's not running that she'd stashed her bags and was running around the parking garage while I was talking to her. <laughs> yeah, that's the extreme of not being able to sit still. That was yeah. interesting to me, and I went, oh, gosh, I'm not quite there. <laughs> thank, thank goodness. <laughs> the hobbies I like suit, uh, suit me just fine with sitting still, so... Well, David, thank you so much uh, mm -hmm. for joining us and for writing this fantastic book. I really did enjoy it, and I hope a lot of people pick it up and read. And I'll definitely be keeping an eye on uh, things you post in the future. Great, it's a pleasure. I, thanks for doing. Thanks for having me, and thanks for thanks for doing this. It's really neat. I'm sure I'll be tuning in a lot more now. Oh, <laughs> That's a pleasure. Great. Thanks, thank David. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. So, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we will see you again in the near future. Thank you, Jeff. Always wonderful to work with you. Always a pleasure, Joanne. All right, and we will uh, sign off. Bye.